Uh, welcome to another Face Hammer Worldwide uh, interview segment, and I'm very pleased to say we are joined by uh, the Wargamer Online team, and we've got Luke and Phil from Wargamer Online. So, firstly, thanks very much for taking time out during these times to come on and talk about uh, little men and toy soldiers and all the stuff we love. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. No, it's yeah, great. Thank you. Wait, wait. So, um, firstly, we just want to get people to sort of say a bit about what they do and who they are and, and, and about their hobby. And this is two of you. This is the dual segment. Uh, so maybe we'll take it in turn. So I don't know if one of you wants to start off with your sort of hobby background and what you do and, and a little bit about the Wargamer online. So I need okay. to who wants to lead. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in because once Luke gets started, that will be the end of it. So uh, maybe That's I'm true. a good place yeah. to start. <laughs> Crikey, hobby, hobby background. I started with um, Warhammer Fantasy First Edition. So um, back there in the, the black and white printed books. Um, and I, I, as a kid, I'm not joking, played up until about third edition when it became this sort of big book. And um, it was all about Siege and all the rest, and we had a lot of fun with that. And as ever with these things, drifted away from the hobby for quite a number of years, basically. And God, it was about seven years ago now, seven, eight years ago, we were walking past the Games Workshop with my son, Jack. And he was like, hey, what's this about, looking through the window? And I did that very, very dangerous thing. I said, hey, let's go inside. I used oh, to do this yes. when I was young. <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> that was it. Uh, we walked out, I think, with five Fenrisian wolves. And, a, and a, you know, a little pack of starter Eldar, I think, is how it all started. Um, but more recently, what we started Wargamer Online um, as a channel three years ago now, three, four years ago now. The team's changed a little bit as time's gone on. Um, and I'd say primarily our focus is Age of Sigmar right now. That That's yeah. our love and our passion. So a lot of Age of Sigmar stuff going on. And I think more recently, we've had a, a kind of, boost of interest because we were one of the uh, the few surviving bat rep channels during lockdown due to the, the the fortune of having jack who's part of the team uh locked down in the same house as me so we were able to keep putting bat reps out and in fact we actually increased them we were putting them out weekly and um, running them in a long format but we can chat about that later so that's where i am now as far as armies are concerned a lot of age of sigmar um and, and if, you know we've got 40k in there but like i say it's hard to break away when we're we're so uh, knee deep in Sigma right now. It's never a good place to be knee deep in Sigma. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh, so I'm Luke, do you want to tell us about that yourself, <laughs> and then uh, we can get into the main, <laughs> main topic. Uh, yeah, well, the the hobby got into that when I was young. The same old story. Uh, get in there when you're young, and then you kind of tailor away as you get older. Um, and then I, I probably stopped playing about when I was 13 and then got back into it later in life when I was about 20, 24, 25. Uh, just saw the tournament scene, like listening in on podcasts and stuff. And then I thought I wanted to try out the tournament, tournaments and just proper went into it from there, like just playing really competitive play in 8th uh, in edition fantasy. That's when I met uh, all you lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't uh, make it on. sound so ominous. You're like, I met, oh, yeah, you lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think it's the other way around. Sorry, boy. You're affectionately sorry. known as Mr. 400, weren't you, for a while? Yeah, uh, yeah but Dan called me 500, didn't he, just to really... Uh get on Jack's uh, nerves. Like, oh, <laughs> Maths was never a strong point being an accountant, but you know. <laughs> so, but I think, uh, no, it's uh, it's good. So you obviously you came into the scene and you kind of hit it with a storm, didn't you, a little bit back in the day when you when you, when you were able to get onto, onto events. And then uh, Age of Sigma kind of landed and you went quiet for a while, but you kind of come back into the scene now and you, uh, you managed to take out the Facehammer GT as well. So... You know, you were... Yeah, yeah. First, first try at Age of Sigma. Give, uh, give my bros a tournament. <laughs> <laughs> Take it out, which is good. And then I've done a few more. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's been good. It's like a completely different way of playing Age of Sigma to Eighth Edition was. Yeah. In it, and but they were both great in in different ways. But it's the scene. The scenes, scenes brilliant now. But if you want the social kind of thing. Yeah, well, not right now because of the world, but yeah, but yeah, uh, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If we hit pause and think of it, you know, 
nine months ago, whatever it was, and go, yeah, it's brilliant right now. Um, so that's really cool. So um, I think it's probably a good idea to talk a little bit more about your channel. And you, you, so you, you primarily focus on battle reports. Is is that right? Is that your sort of your forte, your stick? Is that is you do other stuff on there as well, or? Yeah, we, I mean, we we kind of do the full range of stuff. Really, we have painting tutorials, uh, you know, boxing unboxings, reviews, a uh, little bit of deep dive into things like battle terms and all the rest. Um, but over lockdown again due to the nature of it the, the focus has been on on battle reports on a weekly release of those saying that now jack's heading back to university tomorrow so um we'll be going down to battle reports you know a battle report released every two weeks and then in between that you know probably three live shows into this first between the sort of two weekly uh battle reports so again we'll get back into a normal format of hobby hangouts um and and then you know maybe the odd product review and those kind of things we've got a, a few uh friends launching kickstarters who are sending some stuff along we're going to talk about but so kind of more of a hobby channel and, and falling back into that pattern really we started off very much as hobbyists as opposed to a focus on the competitive side of stuff yeah. luke i mean luke joining the team I, I, it's kind of a, a long story between Luke and myself, but I've essentially I, I've adopted him as his hobby dad, um, simply <laughs> because we share we, we share the same surname, so it just seemed to make sense that I just added him to the family. Uh, it's a bit like Luke, you know, it's a bit like Facebook; you just it add family member, and that was it. Um, yeah. So <laughs> he he was the the one really that I think brought a, a much more competitive focus to the channel, and 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 I have to say it's you know brought myself and. And Jack along in terms of our gaming as well. He kind of upped the ante. You can't, I mean, you can't play against Luke and and not learn a few things. You know, that's the. Uh, I don't mean to, uh, you know, to to blow his trumpet too hard, but you know, every <laughs> game's a learning experience against Luke. Not always for the better, but uh, no. always a learning experience. <laughs> yeah, well, try to get it that way. Losing doesn't really matter in the in the practice just losing is learning primarily if you're just smashing people in practice you don't really learn anything so yeah we were talking to Darren about being... that earlier wasn't it and about that you know it's uh it, it's better to seek out the challenge and the good player and and lose and uh, put yourself on the back foot and even in a game going well if this role goes this way we know the result so let's just pretend it went the other way and then like you know play it out and see what happens so I think that's it's always a good way to when you're practicing to have an objective to improve your game rather than just I think the play. first think the first 10 15 games I played against Luke it was my challenge was to get one turn further on in the game before he told me <laughs> I'd already lost you know so sometimes I'd deploy it and go well you've already lost but let's let's play it out and you know <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's good like that I remember he him telling me uh, telling me in a pub that how much he was going to smash me <laughs> and, uh, how, that, how that worked out, Luke? I don't know, but uh, that was. Uh, you yeah. uh, you give me best thoughts for smiling all the way through as you took all my toys off. That's it, mate. <laughs> you can smile while I'm doing that. That's what I'm doing, so. <laughs> I had to give you something out of that game. You know? <laughs> no, it's, it's good fun. Um, sorry, Les, you were going to say something. I cut you off there. So. Um, no, I just say like that's like when I played Luke, like because I've never beat Luke. Is that? Um, we played a practice game and I deployed it and he was like stop deploying like that straight away what are you doing and just like literally just took over what I was doing just like no 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 like you know let's do it differently um, but yes yeah, it's, it's a learning experience and like it, it's you know he's Luke's helped me a lot like there's a couple of people that I've, I'd say it's helped me on my, my gaming journey and like one's Russ and the other's Luke just by um, the amount of time that we, we spend talking and someone else has just joined the chat is Maudsley like you know he's another person that's helped me on like my my journey to become an average gamer as I said earlier on um, but it's um, <laughs> and, um, but yeah like it's it's one of those things isn't it? you always got to seek out the good players and lose to those to then get better and I think you and Terry in 8th edition league did something similar didn't you like when Terry was like smashing people and like doing really well in eighth edition, you two are always not on the phone about different bits. I had to teach him how to play all the time, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's always good to go through go through even if you smash someone, try and learn from if whether it could have been even more of a beating or <laughs> <laughs> what have you uh, I think you know for the battle reports that we did over lockdown we, we kind of 
brought a little bit of that to the channel. Just just as lockdown was kicking in, we we completely changed the format of our battle reports and made them more illustrative of what was going off during the game. Mm. And we decided to kind of go to a long format as well, which we know is not kind of popular for, for everybody. You know, some of our battle reports are two and a half hours long. But the reason they kind of go over that time is they more or less run in real time. Yeah. And we take time to explain what we're doing rather than just, yeah, and why we're doing it. So, yeah, totally. you know, I'm going to move this unit over here and we take time to say, because I'm, what I'm hoping to do is if I can get this charge off and get over there and then maybe I can snag that objective with a couple of models. And that, that does lengthen the format, but we intentionally lengthen the format. For, I mean, for two reasons. One, because we thought it'd be useful for players who are coming into the game to go, well, what is actually happening? And the other point was, is everybody was stuck in lockdown. So if you could stick a battle report on for two and a half hours with people rambling away, uh, you could get some painting done. You know, so that was the yeah. that was the idea. Yeah, it's almost like you wanted to almost <clears throat> produce longer content so people have more of a distraction to, to and get their hobby fix without actually being able to play games. You know, so uh, I guess it's a, a good move. Um, one thing I would ask um, with recording battle reports because we did one many moons ago when AOS first came out, yeah, and it was a it was a proper chore <laughs> to, re to record um, and edit and cut together. Yep. And um, how do you find the process? I mean, obviously you've been doing it so long now, you probably got it down to a fine art. But how when you first started? I mean, you were sort of doing stuff with a handy cam, and you were like, oh, okay. And then it was, I mean, how did you sort of evolve that process, and and, and how much of a, a learning curve was it? I, I, a hell of a learning curve. Let's yeah. let's get that out of the way. And we definitely wasted hours and hours and hours of our time, without a doubt. Um, we started off with hand cam. So if you go right back to the beginning of the channel, you see us doing hand cam, and it's very much the familiar format, you know, the camera pointing around, trying to show as many dice rolls as possible and, and moving around as you do that, and quite heavily edited because you kind of, as you start moving units around, you're doing everything one-handed, and, you know, it all starts to shake around. And we we changed that format for a couple of reasons. Uh, one one of my friends actually suffers from epilepsy, and 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 said to me one time, I can't watch battle reports because if the camera moves too quickly, it actually makes me feel unwell. Yeah, um, yeah. And we were, to, and it, so it started off as a challenge of saying, how can we be a little bit more static on the camera but uh, still show the details? So we we changed to this kind of fixed camera focus. And it was a little bit like, um, I think we were, this is probably six months before Games Workshop started to do battle reports themselves. So we introduced a map cam um, and then like a, a, a fixed camera, but it made the editing and, and the handheld camera and it made the editing insane. You know, we would record for three, four hours and then there would be 15 hours of editing. Yeah. And, and, and we, we got, we went even crazy because then we realized you can't see the dice properly. So we introduced dice cams. And uh, I think we ended up in like a seven camera setup and they looked fantastic when they were finished, but they'd take 20 hours of editing and it just became untenable. Um, mm. And I think to a degree that probably did as a disservice and that was the learning curve because it slowed down, you know, YouTube likes regular contacts. It likes it to hit regular and we weren't regular enough, I think, for, for us to, you know, to, to, to have an impact. And really we had a hiatus of doing the battle reports, I'd say, for about nine to 12 months while um, we went away and had a big think about the technology, how we film the reports, and 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 also how we edit them. And what we try and do now is we more or less treat the battle reports as if we're doing a live stream. Yeah. So a lot of the cameras and a lot of the positioning of cameras and a lot of the overlays are essentially done live. And in fact, if you watch our battle reports, sometimes you'll actually see me turn around and, and change the score as I'm talking, you know. So a lot of it is done live. And the only thing we have to edit then is essentially the bits between takes. You know, you finish a move and then, you know, we might just ramble on for a little bit to each other and realize we'd left the recording going or something like that. So what we're really doing is just trimming footage. I'm getting a little bit technical now, but the, what it what it changed was rather than having to do all this multi-camera editing, it's a single video stream because yeah. it's treated like a live stream. And all we have to do is trim the footage. 
And it's got our edit time down to around about three and a half, four hours for a two and a half hour program. You know, so that's that's pretty efficient. You know, it's it's more or less one to one between end footage and you know the the editing process. And I think that's enabled us to you know that was a through necessity more than anything enabled us to produce more content over over lockdown. And we were very fortunate because I'd spent a lot of time faffing with the technology. I think, and we just about got it right as lockdown happened. And the first two, you can see we were testing the tech. And there was a few problems here and there, but you know we got there. So it's been a challenge, and it is a—it's a hell of a learning curve, especially if you're coming from, you know, I, I don't have a photography background or anything like that. So you have to kind of start right from the beginning and audio and all the rest. You know, I was about to ask you that if been, you had any background in film or or sound or anything like that, or you've just muddled your way through. Um, when 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 I was when I was seventeen and at art college, I, I made a gangster movie in a in a, an abandoned mortuary. Um, uh, so <laughs> that's my, that was my only experience. Very arty, all in black and white. Very David Lynch, you know. So, but that was that was it. There's, <laughs> there was a, no no other experience. I mean, it, you know, I've always had an interest in sort of cameras and technology and those kind of things. But at the end of the day, it's been a, a hell of a lot of research, a hell of a lot of Googling. And the truth is, is there are no answers online. You just have to keep trying and experimenting. And, you know, eventually you kind of fine tune it and you get it there, you know. You have to find what works for you. I mean, I remember we did the podcast <clears> and we started off and we were trying to record over Skype and using like these sort of like Skype recorders and... Yeah, you know, we had different sound issues, and then there was the editing, and you just you kind of stumble your way through it. And um, obviously, we've we've been trying to branch our sort of content out a little bit and do a few different things, and we're all just learning at the moment. So we we've been doing a couple like YouTube videos and just taking like Discord chat and doing like uh, you know like screen capture and very basic or crude sort of stuff. Um, but I think the um, it is a very interesting journey but it's you see a lot of these people they say just start and then it will force you to learn really basically because exactly. you just get chucked to the deep end and you just it's like you know people forgive you a little bit because you know in the day it's it's optional if they want to watch it or not you know it's not always the best but yeah try yeah. and uh try and improve i mean we appreciate the support of people you know joining in and that and and those that have checked our youtube content out on it's very um it's all very early days for us but mm. i'd say what made you start the channel what was the kind of the catalyst that made you go i want to do this because i mean for us it was we were talking on skype a lot and painting and, and we were reminiscing about oh i remember when we used to listen to these podcasts that no longer kind of produce any content and we just decided to have a go ourselves, and that was kind of where it started, and it never really stopped. But how did you get into doing a YouTube channel and 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 doing all this kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, the motivation right at the beginning was uh, a, a friend of mine, Sam, who was a uh, you know working as a, a store manager for Games Workshop, um, uh, uh, found himself out of a job basically, right. and. Um, a great painter and i said you know and i said to him you really should do painting tutorials i think they're fun you know you're a fantastic painter i i I'd grown up alongside things like um uh, uh peachy and duncan you know i think it was i think peachy actually taught him how to paint when he was a you know a, a kid in games workshop sort of thing um and i said you know you should do painting tutorials that'd be a great thing for you to try but he had no technical experience whatsoever and no um you know uh, and, I, and so i basically said look I'll, I'll help with all the channel setup with the cameras with the audio i'll get you all set up and everything and and you know one thing turned to another and throughout all of this i just ended up sitting alongside the guy and we started to do um you know a few things together like hobby hangouts and then we're all like well yeah, actually let's have a go at battle reports and that and that's how it started basically it started off by helping a mate out to get a yeah. channel up and running and then before we knew it we were kind of we're actually a channel now and we had some really fantastic initial success the channel kind of boomed very quickly within the first eight weeks but we what people don't realize it we'd, we'd spent six months producing content yeah before we actually went live with the channel and i think that was great because we had this backlog of content that we could just constantly release. And whatever we were releasing that backlog, we were producing new content. 
But I think you're right. What it actually meant was by the time we were getting towards the end of our back catalogue, we were already frustrated with the quality of it because of the lessons we'd learned along the way. So we actually binned quite a lot of pre-prepared content because you've just learned actually that doesn't work yeah. and that doesn't keep people's attention. And, you know, I think that's, you have to, the other interesting thing about when you do get into that as well is to not, you tend to start almost worrying too much about the technology. Is the camera quality good? Is the audio, is all those things good? And then you actually forget about, is the content interesting? For a load of people watching on their phones, <laughs> a load of people watching on their phones as well, who just really like you and the stories you're telling, and then you're worrying about that. Exactly, you're just worrying about the wrong thing. And sometimes it's just, you know, make your content and, you know, fine tune as you go along. And, you know, you guys are all wonderfully interesting people with beautiful beards and, Proto beards and, <laughs> and, and beards. beautifully yeah. clean shaven chins. You know, of course, people yeah. want to listen to you guys. <laughs> Proto beards. It, it, does, it does kind of look like a really weird version of the Brady Bunch on my screen right now. It does. Oh, yeah. We could call it the Brady like Bunch. Picture of it. Really? So, <laughs> we'll just start like pointing at each other oh. and doing all this sort of stuff. But I need to take a picture of it because it, it literally looks like the Brady Bunch, at the moment, especially with it spills <laughs> that green behind. Yeah, there. exactly. He's got a oh, green yeah. screen. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Um, we don't use Discord for the channel, so I didn't realise you can't replace the green, can you? No. But there you go. Well, to be honest, we, we only prime. just started... I mean, I we use Discord for PC gaming, basically, and um, we just decided hmm. to make a Discord server, and then we found out yesterday that you couldn't have more than 25 people watching if you've got cameras on. So I was like, oh, I better put it on Twitch as well. So I, I just chatted it on Twitch yesterday, but I've literally have no idea about Twitch, but it's... Uh, it seems to be okay and, yeah. and and running quite smoothly, so it's uh, cool. it's fine. But it's it's like it's all these things, isn't it? It's just um, it's just the learning curve, really. We we went up to yeah. um, uh, Element, and and Jay's got a studio up there for tabletop gaming, and we we went and sat in his studio and had a look around at the kit and stuff and the setup because really what we want to be able to do is to have our own studio set up that we can do content in and. Um, just trying to look basically just steal from other people because you know they've done the hard work, so you know, well, that's... <laughs> just ironically, out. ironically, Jay's setup has been inspired by your guys' setup, yeah. So, like third hand information has gone full circle, yeah. It's like the yeah. second is complete, oh, that's, that's it's a bit like a really bad rerun of Battlestar Galactica, it's all happened before it's, and it's, it's happened like, again, uh, kind of thing, you know? hobby section, <laughs> like, that's it, like, <laughs> share the love. Share I, the I love. think that's. <laughs> I think we, with this latest set of battle reports, we finally got to a space that, and I, I think this is the other important thing is, is you do need to make content you actually want to make. Oh yeah, um, because if you if you go out of that, you, you just don't enjoy it, and it's hard, and it becomes a chore rather than something that's fun. And we know for in, we get sort of quite polarized comments sometimes on the channel. People love the setup, and you know, and we get wonderful comments like the best best setup ever etc etc but at the same time people just go just give me a hand cam and give me 45 minute video that's all i want you know and it's at the end of the day i think you learn you can't please everybody no. so it's it's an it's a it's a never-ending um task to try and do that so what you have to do is focus on well what do i like to do and if there's enough people out there that like to watch what you like to do then you've got an audience and I think if it's not then Fair enough, you know. I think that's really important to stay like authentic to who you are and what you want to do. And um, I was watched a video um, by Miniac actually the other day because I like you know, I know he's he can be a bit uh, polarizing in opinion on his approach to things, but he put a video out there basically saying, "Look, I'm not going to paint models I don't want to paint anymore. You know, I kind of want to do something different because it's not what I enjoy." And it's almost like you learn these lessons where you've you've stopped being authentic to yourself and realizing that now you've you've turned the thing you love into something you're not really enjoying and actually people will pick up on it straight away if you're not invested in what you're doing and what you're talking about or what you're what you're playing so i think it's really important for <clears throat> anyone creating content or doing anything to actually enjoy what they're doing and because if you're not if you're just doing it for the sake of it it's it's very obvious and, and you're not going to retain an audience and i think you're right as well about pleasing people is it's it, and it was, we did the same when we started face yeah. and we did this i did the same when we did the south coast gt tournament we said well we're sort of a tournament we want to play in and we think that people want it too but we won't know and then it was successful but we didn't 
we we run it for ourselves in a way because mm. you, you know, there are people that don't like that style well that's fine you know that it's not it's not they don't have to come but it's the point is is that there's enough people that do like that style so uh, i think that's really important to stay true to your to your roots you know rather than trying to capture the most the most dopamine infusing likes or or views and stuff like that just to just to be like oh i've got lots of people because i've i've done all this content that hits all the seo and all the all the hashtags and all the rest of it and i've put it on all the different platforms and i've dredged up interest from across the the algorithms you know and i think that end of the day like that that's important i think if you're trying to build something but it's not as important yeah. as producing just bagged content. on everything that i could do yeah, I, know. I was just, I just trying <laughs> to keep you honest. That's just like a backhanded pop thing. What I did. <laughs> no, it's not aimed at you. Come on. No, what I mean, I mean that shouldn't be the motivation for doing it. The motivation for doing it should be what you're doing, like the content, and all that stuff's important yeah. to get your content out there. But at the end of the day, the important bit is the message what you're putting across or what you're saying or doing. And I think that's really important message. Anyone doing any sort of content, whether it's a blog or a podcast or a YouTube content or even Twitch. Just be true to who you are, basically. I think it's the the key message mm. there. It's not going to help you be enthusiastic I, I think... when you've got to edit something at midnight, is it? Like, it's you want you want to be into your stuff to make it feel the least like work possible, or when it does feel a lot like work, for you to be proud and pleased with what you're doing and know that it's it's true to what you you would like to watch yourself at the end of the day. And like, you can't make this stuff less hard work, so you may as well make yourself more enthused about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, one of the things that we really, and, and I, I think this is, it says a lot about the Sigma community is the feedback we had on the battle reports. You know, it's not always positive, uh, but I'd say 99.9% .9 of the time when it is criticism, it's constructive. Yeah. And, and I love that. I just love that about the Sigma audience. So much so we've actually started to feature those comments as part of our videos. And that was something we started quite early. It's actually, cool. that's a really good comment. That's a useful tip. We're actually going to put it on our next video. And it's not, um, it's not you know, uh, sort of gratification. It's yeah. actually there to say, that's actually a good point. Let's stick it on there. Or that's a funny comment. I like that. And we put that on there. And so for the first, as we're doing the intros to the battle reports at the bottom of the screen, we've got like the you know, kind of 10, 20 comments that were from the previous set of videos that were up live. And, and, and for me, that's, again, that's, it, it's one of the things that keeps me motivated is that engagement. So we tried to, if that motivates me, let's acknowledge it within the content we make as well. You know, and, and I think that's the thing is, is, is trying to make those personal motivations inform what goes into your content. I think that's a really Absolutely. important message as well because we 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 sort of um, we've all, I mean you could always look back in hindsight because it's twenty twenty right and say oh we should have done that in the past should have done this in the past but I think one of the things that where we were producing a podcast and we're kind of like firing it out and that that's what we would do record something fire it out and we can see this it's getting a lot of downloads and stuff like that but it's not necessarily um, there's no interaction really we even even the point where. Um, especially with like myself and Les, because we're play testers and things like that, we kind of retreat from social media engagement because mm -hmm. you don't want anyone picking yeah. on what you're saying and trying to say, "Oh, you said this," or "You're working on you." Even painting, you put a picture, so you're painting. Yeah. Why are they painting that? Surely there's something, and it's so we kind of re retreated a little bit from from the the, the the sort of the community, which is a kind of a mistake in hindsight, and and like really yeah. what we want to do with our new content and, and and that is have more of that community engagement and give people a way to talk to us and that's mm. why we wanted to do the discord and things like that because although we were very engaged with the tournament community because we we're all we we're all prolific on that it wasn't necessarily through the content and um the great thing about internet and the content and and that is it can be digested across the entire world and you know, but a lot of why we did Facehammer Worldwide was because normally this would be Facehammer GT weekend. And we thought, well, why don't we yeah. do something a little bit different? And uh, it was a little bit lastminute.com, but, you know, <laughs> so I'm glad we're here. So it's, uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's all good. Um, so, Luke, how did you get, um, how did you get involved in all this then? Did you come on later and, and what's your kind of, uh, how did you get well, dragged in? I, I knew Sam and Phil who started the channel 
before um prim- primary sam um and then sam kind of tailored off it just wasn't for him in the end and then phil just mentioned to me do you want do you want to become part of it i, I couldn't really be a big part of it because um yeah obviously the work and everything but and then i started to do we started doing like reviews and stuff didn't we and going on the live chats and stuff. And I was going to start doing battle reports, but then obviously COVID hit and it's uh, we can't really do any battle reports together yet. But that, that is the future to get more battle reports with different people uh, on and stuff like that. And yeah, so just, I've only really, I'm only really a, a recent addition to the channel. Um, but yeah, hopefully in the future, it goes forward with, uh, with more content. I'm, I'm looking at trying to maybe get in a base up here as well at some point so we can push forward push forward more more battle rep- reports with different people on but also that's a like a long term kind of thing yeah because you're you're uh, yeah we had not... we had sorry go on sorry go on i was gonna say we had two studios prior to lockdown for filming battle reports oh, and right. essentially one of the studios got mothballed um, because it just needed public access. So at the moment, the studio, the, the first studio is in my home, which is, again, fortunate because it meant we could just keep filming. Uh, but the second studio, we've actually um, modified it to be a, a, essentially a mobile studio. So we can do things like cover live events. And what you see on our fully edited battle reports, we can essentially reproduce a mobile um, it's taken a hell of a lot of faffing with technology, but the plan is to kind of pack that up and get that up to Luke as well. So if the COVID situation continues for the foreseeable, there's a, there's a possibility of having both studios up and running again, which will, you know, again, up the content level. Yeah, because we, we, we had the, the Masters uh, streaming, didn't we, uh, as like a first mm. kind of tournament stream thing uh, lined up. Obviously, it didn't go ahead because of COVID, but that's still still in the plans to maybe do a few events a year, uh, streaming tournaments, but try and, try, and, try and put our own spin on it kind of thing, try, trying to build a story behind the tournament and just trying to get it. It's hard just to watch. I don't really watch any battle reports myself. It's hard, it is hard to watch two, three hours of gaming. <laughs> Yeah, but just try and try, <laughs> try and yeah, change yeah. it. You know, <laughs> try and try and reach the different audiences. Um, yeah, I mean, Phil and Jack did a great, a great job. It's just, it's just having a different view on it. I think it's yeah, it's it <laughs> gone. Uh, sorry, I was gonna, I was gonna say like I think with with the bar reports, it is very like you need to be invested in it, don't you? A little bit, I think. Like for me, I don't think uh, Warmer is amazing to watch like when you're invested in the the people or the armies or the event um i think like when or like this is a, a really competitive list or like say that someone did a, a battle report with the new luminef stuff you'd be like oh that's i'm really invested in luminef at the moment that would be cool to watch um i think would i sit and watch three and a half hour game i probably wouldn't but then i'm coming at it from a different place because i like to think of myself as a competitive gamer I wouldn't do that, but at the same time, I do watch the the you know the war gamer online battle reports because I think that they're actually when I do watch a battle report, you're the ones that I go to because I think they're actually the way you produce them is really good and they're like concise, but they're also fast enough so I don't get inter- so I don't get bored. They're just they're they're really good. So it's it's not like a computer game where you can watch like because sometimes when you watch like a computer game, it's so snappy like on a battle like you know it's there needs to be like people you need to know so much about the hobby in general you need to have someone who is good enough to especially if you're commentating on a a game be able to go like right that guy's actually moved that there because he wants that's a bait he's going to get that charged because this is going to come around here and it's understanding that i think and you know the what you know what the the warm community team do and and what rob does is i think that could be you know you can definitely do a different route i think and and Mm. that's something that like you know i think there's an, an opportunity there I'm not saying that either those two are bad i just think that there's for me it, it's what you i like what you guys do with your videos is what i'm trying to say yeah the, 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 good, uh, the good thing with what phil and jack have been doing is that they because they go through what that why they're going to do that you can just skip through the skip through it and see the juicy bits if what or whatever bits that you prefer 
And that's what I've, I've, <laughs> 12 I mean, sixes on 20 dice. I'm just. That's the juicy thing. I think um, it's interesting because I've I've done commentary on uh, Warhammer TV and, and I know Les did a bit as well. And it's like, it's it's really interesting when you're on there and you're you've got a game that there's a lot of uh, analysis to talk about. There's a lot of things you can talk into, but there is just that downtime in a game where it is just mapping out dice rolls to find the result. And I know the game yeah. suffered a little bit from what I would call like. Um, like re-roll bloat which is what I is probably what I would say where everything re-rolled everything with ever saves with re-rolls and then if you roll this you get to do this and then to actually like work out a result of two things fighting was starting to take like 15 20 minutes and and sometimes you're sat there going well there's nothing really to talk about about this we just need to wait and see what happens so I think yeah. the difficulty when you when we did our battle report and we we we, had, we went into it eyes wide shut basically and just went what we're going to do and and we were fortunate to have Liam Cook involved because he'd done work in media before and he was kind of like directing like herding cats me and Les through the whole process but yeah. we had like multiple cameras we had one the battery was failing the light was going we didn't have any lights set up yeah we were like how do we do it and then we started taking pictures and doing panning shots and doing interviews with yeah. two cameras so cut to the two cameras and then edit yeah. all together then they did commentary over the top of it and you're like to and make it really dumb down interesting <laughs> yeah, yeah I think to make it it's really like interesting dumb down lists. it's difficult because you're like how do you because and sometimes and, and you know the best of the world you play a game and the game is a bit boring because there isn't you know it's, yeah. it's can be a bit one-sided you know what i mean and and sometimes that just happens that's just age of sigma right you you know sometimes you set up and you go well you can make, write the most balanced lists in the world but then you get like a, a monster double turn and it's just like oh well that's basically game over um and i think it's uh it's really interesting so i think what when you play a game do you try and create a a story not intentionally or fixing or anything like that, but do you try to try and like line up the two lists and, and the story of what you're doing to to make it as interesting as possible, or do you just kind of go, we want to play with these armies and let's see what happens, and then we just record it? Or what's the? Do you have an affin of that thought process? I think a mixture of both. The, the our preference is the narrative, you know, and again, it, we're both coming from a hobbyist point of view. You know, Luke finally com convinced me to start doing tournaments and I've loved them but that's an entire another story we started from a narrative base so when I build my armies I'm 100% thinking about what does this look like when you deploy it because I just want it to look amazing so you know there's units in there you just never see generally in a competitive list and I just can't help myself but paint them and then cry over three Kelly and Alapexes you know as why <laughs> why did I paint those um but <laughs> the the narrative definitely builds i think we look for it and it builds between the players and you get grudge matches between factions and and i think that and and it's reminding the audience that that exists so when jack rolls out his daughters of cain and it's his close to tournament list and we know it's going to be he calls it the blender you know it's yeah, just yeah. and off it goes you know and it just blends through everything when he rolls that list out i and we've already uh, you know decided ahead okay it's going to be dok versus i don't know my new Iden of deepkin then you're already thinking this one's going to be bloodthirsty and let's match it up and but, you know, there was one time I think he was playing um, Iron Jaws for a couple of games and he just had this character that just kept surviving, you know, three or four battle reports in a row. And in the end, that turned into the narrative, you know. He, yeah. I think in the end, at the final game we had, he took Alariel out, you know. It was just this grudge match against Sylvaneth and, uh, you know, it, it resulted in him finally, you know, killing a god and it was just hilarious. We, lo we loved it <laughs> and we hope that the audience engaged with it and and you know they do and you know if you've taken the time to explain it for the because not everybody watches every single one in the order that's the other thing you have to take time at the start to explain this character's back and this is what happened last time and but at the same time be conscious if you spend 20 hours doing that you've already lost everybody <laughs> so yes we want the narrative we want the narrative we want to do it as fast as possible and i think it makes it more fun for us and it definitely makes it more fun for the audience one of the things we are doing post lockdown is we're going to be, you know, focusing a little bit more on the, you know, building a campaign. Jack's already started writing two or three campaigns. 
Um, so we've got two or three different streams all taking place and two of the campaigns actually overlap. So we'll be running sort of a narrative campaign um, and, you know, sometimes with a meeting engagement list, sometimes even dropping into Warcry and then coming back out to a full game um, and, and, you know, and trying to do that. But it, again, takes time to invest into that and even longer to kind of produce the content. Yeah, and, uh, I, th I think with lists though, you definitely, you two definitely uh, write two lists, which, which isn't just a rollover, like like what Russ was Russ was saying before. You can't just get games where it's just over, can't you? In like turn one, if I, if I got like a tournament list out and it's just over in one turn, it's just not nobody's going to want to watch that, are they? So you do, you and Jack are no. pretty good at writing those kind of lists where they do battle it out, maybe all five turns almost, and you. Quite yeah, a lot it. of them run to turn five. And I think that's the thing is if Jack's bringing his DOK and I show up with, you know, I've not shown the Sharks yet, then he's already thinking, geez, I'm going to have to drop something. Otherwise, this is over turn two, you know. So you do do that. I think sometimes as well when you just do that double and you know the double is pretty much going to end the game in turn three, you, you have to make a decision whether you're recording an, <laughs> an event or whether you're producing a bit of entertainment. Yes. If we're showing, and we've got a rule, an in-house rule, which makes perfect sense to us. If the factions have been featured before, then whichever way the, the rollouts work, that's how they happen. So if the game's over by turn three, well, we you know we try to balance this, but that's how it works, and it's close. But if we're showing a faction for the very first time and it has a double, that would pretty much end the game there. We may change that outcome. Yeah. But it's only... Only ever if we're showing a faction for the first time. Otherwise, you've just wasted. You've not only wasted your audience's time. You've wasted your two time. and a you know yeah. two hours of your time. You know so. Yeah. But it's the only time we would fix a role, for want of a better word, is we've sort of, you know, and it's only happened a couple of times where someone's got the double, and you go, that that is game over, isn't it? So do we just change that outcome? Um, you know, like I say, but if if we've featured the armies before, whatever whatever hits the dice tray, hits the dice tray. That's what we say to each other, even though sometimes you go, this has been such a good game if I'd have got that double. But you just push on with it, you know. Because I do think otherwise, as soon as you make an exception, you start cheating everything. Oh, that yeah. combat was terrible. I rolled really below average. Let's re-roll everything, you know. You can't, mm -hmm. yeah. you can't be doing that. No, it's like the, I think that's that's true. You've got to be kind of... I think the priority role is maybe the exception to prove the rule, isn't it? Because it's going to be a more interesting event if you um, if you sometimes flip-flop that round. Um, that's cool. So do you... I mean, obviously, you're talking about a lot of, like, story-based narrative sort of content. And obviously, we know Luke from sort of cutting-edge kind of tournament play. Um and so is that is that where you more stuff we want to feature like more match play kind of competitive analysis or is it is it still very much narrative driven and and, and luke's just involved or is it no luke's in there for exactly that reason you know he brings the analytical mind uh, i have to be careful otherwise you know we can't let his ego get away with him can we but yeah. it brings that analytics it brings the understanding um and we'd be idiots for that for not to not feature that as part of the channel and i think the only thing that stopped us from doing that to a degree yeah. is covid but lucas I, th I think luke did yourself a little bit of a disservice there by saying you know i've not been that involved during covid because he's been involved a hell of a lot in the background as well so as we've been building this he's on chats going hey you need to try this unit out you need to get some of those things you can't take that army without featuring this because that's what people are looking for and he's bringing that broader experience uh, but there are times he sends me a list for you that I just go, no, no I'm not playing 400 salad. Why won't you play two tankers? <laughs> 42 Tengas. So I was like, no. Or 200. No, sorry, Luke. Yeah, <laughs> You're summoning Tom Maudsley. He's already lying in the chat saying that he's all I about know. what the army looks like in its narrative. <laughs> oh, no. There he is. <laughs> <He's just laughs> Uh, <laughs> looks like he's got 240 chain gas and on his on his shelf there somewhere he has talked about doing it <laughs> he's, he's still, he is still muted though so it's all so, so good so, um, yeah it's uh, don't get you, Jim. it's like no. Candyman can't say his name too many times yeah, yeah I think we can bring more of the competitive side to uh, live streams we can 
kind of just you know like do that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, maybe and maybe when they got a setup near me, could maybe get a few few lads around and. So you guys are yeah. based locally with each other then, because I'm obviously no, no, you're you're sort of up up by where the dragon slayers are, aren't you, Luke and stuff? Is it? Are you quite far yeah, away? Yeah, yes, I'm in she- Sheffield area and uh, Phil's L- Lemons Bar, so it's about mm-hmm. an hour and a half, two hours, isn't it, apart? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you know, we can make, we we can make that work. Um, you know, I travel quite a bit up and down the UK, and uh, so it's the kind of thing we can make work. It, it's one of those things we need we need COVID to um, just bugger off just for it. Away. We don't like this. Getting ridiculous. Getting ridiculous. Just go away. away. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, I think, like I say, I, I think we'll, we'd be crazy not to focus on that. And Lucas, Lucas put a hell of a lot more into the background of some of this stuff, and we've done a lot of preparation as well for that kind of next generation, the next season of battle reports and those kind of things. And we, we're talking about um, you know, taking the structural format but applying a different editorial format, so that maybe the more narrative based sit it sit down, put it on for two hours, get a bit of painting done, and giggle at what's going off on screen as we kind of do ridiculous roles and talk about you know epic battles. But then alternatively, there'll be snappier, faster edits, which is just focused on the competitive slant with probably a faster edit battle report, but you know fifteen twenty minutes at the end which is the competitive analysis. Did it perform how you were expecting? And, uh, you know, you guys were talking earlier about kind of, you know, A-B testing. Okay, yeah. well, if you're going to change, what are you going to ch- What are you going to change for the next one? How much do you want to change before you learn something new or you've moved it too far away from evolving it, you know? And I think that's the kind of thing you can bring to that, those, those kind of battles. Yes. Oh, that's, um, it's cool. So, um, um, I think that yeah, I think like the, the snappy competitive stuff will be really good for some people. But I also think that you know, like the the like you said, putting on those two hour battle reports where people are just like you know laughing, joking about the you know what's going on on screen is really good. Um, I think you know the, you can hit both markets definitely. I, 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 I think, think do both of them um, as well. You'll start blending them yeah. together by accident, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, I, I should imagine so. I mean, also as well, we could do like a thirty-minute epic, just repeating loop of Luke screaming, "Put it in the bin." I, I honestly uh, think there's an audience for that. Just <laughs> <laughs> up to celebrity status first. Why not? I mean, some of the stuff people yeah. watch on the in- internet, there's definitely going to be an audience who are into that sort of thing. You, know, you want to see like yeah. they're, they're taking the whole list of ice and guard for twenty-four hours or something stupid like that. It's like yeah. yeah. It's, it, there's, if it, if it can be, someone on the internet will watch it, right? That's the... Yeah. I've got plenty of voice notes if anyone wants to edit that together. I have Luke just going, put it in a bin. <laughs> it's to me all the time. So, I there's, nothing, there's nothing worse than finishing it, an epic conversion. I'm working on a Beast of Chaos army. Every single model is converted. That's including the 80 Ungors. Every single one of them is a conversion. Um, and I know Beasts of Chaos, I know where they sit. As far as Luke's concerned, I should have just dust panned them into the bin a long time ago. But you finish <laughs> that beautiful conversion, send him a picture, bin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's funny. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's it, where a lot of like, Luke's trophy, you remember watching him chuck a trophy in the bin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's his, war, his, his battle victory cry or his, uh, his in the war yeah. or something being rubbish. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Oh, amazing! It's uh, if it's not eels, Luke don't want to know. If that's the thing, isn't it, Luke? <laughs> MSU eels. Oh, no, I'm bored of that. I'm bored of that. Moving on. Moving what, on. What are you moving on to? What are you moving on to? Talk about it. Like people are going to want to know. Like people are going to try and like second guess the Luke Morton TM <laughs> build. Legion of Sacrament at the moment. Oh, okay. Nice. I've been loving them. So hopefully, hopefully, uh, oh, yeah. is there an arcane? Is there an arcane the secrets? Involved? No, yeah. no, just a uh, load of necromancers and wrong, a load of chain rasps and you're good to go. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, you're like, you're being so coy. <laughs> Come on, Lou. You're like, you're like, I'm not giving away anything. Hopefully, <laughs> you like, it makes people just want to give up as you deploy 240 models on the board. And, and just, then it's like... Oh, that's just sums up death rattle, like, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bore you into submission. Here you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I got a few. I got like a Mortis engine and some Black Knights and stuff. And yeah, it seems seems okay. It's not like MSU wheels, but it's it's doing all right. Yeah, I think so, I think there's still some legs in the Legion, but I was really yeah. It's just, it's just powerful abilities. It's got so many powerful abilities, and that the, the all the whole all the within stuff is still so insanely powerful if you do it right. Um, you know, like just putting models back if they're dying you can gain reach because yeah. you can just like conga line you can get all your death saves conga line to your general and yeah it's like, hero phase move and yeah, there's so many things you can do it's it's still really powerful and yeah, maybe maybe the units themselves are not so great and hopefully the points get tweaked but yeah i think that as a book it's still really good yeah, it's, I think it's still got its its strong points, but um, yeah, I think for me, like when I wrote that Legion of Night list that we did a video on, I I was very tempted, but then I just remembered like building those skeletons, and I was like, no, no, I just can't do it. It's not not good. Yeah, the chain rest killed me. There's so many mold lines. Ridiculous. I think, I think for me, like the weird thing is because there's no like tournaments on that. Like it's very difficult to get super excited about gaming when you can't actually game. It's like it's a very I know some people have got like clubs or they're meeting like in in like little bubbles and stuff. Or, or but for me, I've I've not played yeah. since like February, and it's just it's just crazy. Like it's it's really hard to get back into the mindset of uh, of thinking about Warhammer because you know I know you're like like me, Luke. When I was like prolific, is that I was always thinking about the next event, the next list, and I was always doing like two a month. And when me and Terry were during seventh and eighth edition, doing like twenty four tournaments a year, that kind of <laughs> that kind of frequency. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, it was. It's kind of like you you're, you're always on to the next one. You know, like you got like a week prep to get to the next event, and then it's uh, it's kind of a bit bizarre at the moment because you it, it's really hard to get into that mindset because it's like you don't know when it's gonna when it's gonna return to a semblance of normality in terms of competitive gaming. So. I find it hard to paint as well because it's the motivation for me for painting is normally to get a, a, an army on the table, you know, for for an event. And if there's no events, there's no motivation to paint, and it's kind of a vicious cycle. So, how have you? I've been. Uh... Oh, sorry. I said, how have you found it with like? Because obviously, I know you're. I know you've got a gaming oh. club and stuff locally, so you're probably getting a few more, bit more table time. So. I've been playing uh, quite a bit on tabletop simulator. Oh, okay, yeah. So using i'll probably use about 15 16 armies and 20 odd different lists um but obviously that's just more of extreme because you can just use really extreme lists that you probably would never take to a tournament because you're never going to get that kind of list painted like i was using probably used a 42 chain gas about 10 times and i found a, i found it really powerful as I changed the list, the nine haunt list, I put added, I had added, I'm putting twelve spirit hosts in and some, a black coach and stuff, and I still had about twenty six chain gas, and that list was really strong. So it just allowed me to chain, like try every army. I tried ogres out and just tweaked loads of lists, like ready for tournaments. But you kind of, it's hard to, like you saying, for a tournament, it's hard to get motivated to paint because if you're not going to a tournament, pointless painting that army, you might never ever use it again. And it, and I know for me as well, yeah. like because the competitive, the meta is almost so fast. What is good now, by the time it turns back to normal, might not be worth having. So it's uh, it's even yeah. worse. You're almost like waiting, aren't you? So what what should I dive into? So yeah, yeah. I've been getting the legions army ready in the background, and I've got a nine haunt, nine haunt list with the black coach and stuff, but. I just don't know. I just don't know until a tournament comes around. I don't know whether I'll even use it or not. I normally gauge the meta at the time. Yeah. I'll just see what's about. I think it's why the MSU Eels did so well, because it was just so strong in that. Because as a list, it's good. But I think if it was a different meta, that it get it, that list would get beaten quite a lot. It's just It was just good at the time. I don't know whether they'll still be good or not. Well, it's like most lists like that, when they've got like one thing... In, in a in a vast quantity it's kind of like it will only do a few things really well so if there's one there's something out there that's popular that stops that one thing working then the list will fall over so it's it's important to gauge that when you're taking a list that's one well, one or two war scrolls across the entire list it's uh 
it's a bit like when the um the Stonehorn FAQ was changed back in the day and Stonehorn suddenly become like like not not worth taking. That any Stonehorn focused army was completely defunct. So because you your army is that war scroll with a few bits around the edges, so it's quite interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's what's the great thing about the tournament scene. It's a different kind of scene. Just like the list is changing all the time, and that's what that's what keeps you juicy. What keeps my juices flowing in that kind of sense for painting and stuff. I think it's fresh. Um, it? Yeah. Do you, do but, you yeah. find that? Um, obviously, sort of talking to Phil that in terms of like your motivation comes from a different place. I know you talk about the narrative of the story you're doing a Brainhead Army and I was sort of thinking that um and Luke's telling you to put it in the bin. Don't listen to him. If you want to do it, do it. You know, it's fine. No one's gonna <laughs> yeah. judge you. We might judge you a little bit, but on the inside we won't tell you to your face, we'll wait till you're gone. No. Um <laughs> just to say um oh, I just I know. yeah if, I just if it's thought, any consolation it's twist fray, so I could always take it as a Z army, you know, but yeah. <laughs> I, I, Guys, uh, I I have to shoot off and go and do a live for twenty minutes on another channel. But I'll be back and then Worries, mate. Uh, I'm genuinely interested to hear about the Beastman as well because actually surprisingly I've been writing a lot of Beastman lists at the moment and they're all rubbish but they do really appeal to me quite a lot <laughs> we'll uh, catch up then I think, <laughs> I think uh, Byron's Beastman will probably end up being a Zinch army as well I imagine but uh, you know it's, uh, it's what it <laughs> no is no retreat Beastman is the only way yeah <laughs> but I just was going to ask you do you do you do like projects for the story for the stream so you you think well actually or for the channel i should say that you go i want to feature an army so i'm going to paint it or or do you just try and resource it from from around or do you just do your hobby your hobby and you're just documenting that or do you actually go out your way to create armies that you you're not necessarily you know yourself yeah i i i I think, again, coming back to for, for myself and also for Jack to a degree, because we are hobbyists and there's a motivation within that as well, building something for the channel. You know, we've got the little joke hashtag for the channel, which we send to each other. If anybody starts slacking off, you know, if Luke starts saying, I can't get this army painted because there's no tournaments, he just gets hashtag for the channel like 20 <laughs> times in a row and that gets him back in line. Um so, you know, for me, because, you know, there's a hobby based stuff, we do build a lot for the channel. But saying that we've not mentioned, you know, I've talked about Jack and I've talked about Luke, we've not mentioned Liam as well. We've got Liam in the background and he's a prolific painter. He's a very quick painter. So that's fantastic for that point of view. And he he actually supplied probably 50 percent of the armies for the channel during lockdown. So he was, he kind of turned from the only thing I can do is get you guys more models. So we had, you know, a Skaven army uh, done in 10 days, for instance, wow. and, okay. you know, those kind of things. It just really pumped them out and to a great standard as well, a really beautiful standard. So um, I, for the most part, we've tried to do that. We've been fortunate as well. And sometimes we've had armies kind of either, you know, on loan as well to, 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 to create that variance. But inevitably, for me, coming back to the hobbyist, I do need to be a, a kind of emotionally engaged with that army. I started this twist fray army. I really reading the Visa Chaos rules. Um, I, I kind of liked the book when it first came out. I liked its play style, but then there was one page that really got me hooked, which was the description of the twist phrase, the the idea of the Zichian beastman, you know, and and it just started a kind of little creative thing in my head where it's a, sort of okay, I'm going to take every single unit except for one, which was Zangles. So the entire army is based on a, like a variation of Zangles. So my Ungors are actually, you know, uh, the Ungor lower torso, but Acolyte upper torso, um, because the Ungor arms fit that Acolyte upper torso. Oh, that's cool. The Zeech Acolyte upper torso oh, perfectly. Torso. So, 
Uh, so I've got these really hench ungors, which I really like the idea <laughs> of, and uh, you know, and, and then putting kind of zangor heads on top of uh, bestigors and things like that. So they've got this whole avian feel to the entire army, and it's just it's one of those projects that just went out of control because everything just had to have feathers and beaks, and <laughs> it just became a kind of labor of love. And there's a few lists in there which I think will be. Oh, I'm not even going to say it. I was going to say okay to play, but there's a few. <laughs> I was just going to in, in a narrative. So. <laughs> there's a few listeners like, in the bin. <laughs> bin. <laughs> you, you, you took uh, the beastman, didn't you, to a doubles event with Dan? And you yeah, did all right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was with Dan, and you know, he went five and zero, but you know, it was a doubles tournament, so I think we came like ninth. <laughs> So uh, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure the I'm not sure the opponents had as much fun as we did, obviously. <laughs> as much as, much, but so, as, much uh, as they put it in the bin or whatever, um, I have to like the army as well, and I want it. it yeah, yeah, yeah. I will go to the extreme was where if the army looks terrible but the rules are great, I will convert like anything as long as it looks good to fit those roles kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so I'll just get, like, I'll just pick a book. I like the role set and then I'll just make it work with whatever models I can convert. So I still, uh, for, for me, the, uh, the army still has to look good and I want to paint it nicely and stuff. Yeah. Cause your, your, um, your deep kid army is awesome. I'll just say that. And we've obviously featured that on our, on our event when you took it and we've obviously featured it on our uh, video where we talked about the painting competition finalists and uh, things like that so uh, yeah I do love I do love that arm I think it looks great so uh, it was a pleasure to play against it with my dry brushed OBR so. yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we, tu- we, we, we did touch on your game didn't we Russ earlier on about, how many um, models died in that game uh, none <laughs> <laughs> but but who won? You know that was the point. You know. what happens, that's what happens when you scare the catapults, Luke. You know, but don't, don't shoot me! Don't shoot me! Oh wait, there's an objective there, right? Uh, but anyway, we won't talk about that. We've done it enough. Um, <laughs> oh for two. Just saying. No. Uh, <laughs> no, it'd be good. It'd be good to get a, a rematch at, at, with a with a proper scenario at some point in the future, but. Maybe when COVID settled down or something, or maybe we couldn't even record it or something. Who knows? So, yeah. Well, if we get you down yeah, to the yeah. studio as well, yeah. and then then you can just you know stick in a USB stick like they do on Mission Impossible and steal all the technology as well. That's it. Amazing. Job done then. I'll just suspend win, win. myself from the ceiling in a harness, but there's no harness built for that. So. <laughs> I was going to say the technology yeah, doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah, so real cables. We're going to have to deploy yeah. Les as is the, or, or even the Byron like a spider monkey to get to steal your secrets. <laughs> yeah. but, um, I think. I think that's um we'll sort of wrap it up there but I think uh it's been uh, really fun having you guys on and I appreciate you taking the time out of your days to come on and talk about Age of Sigma on your channel and that and I um, wish you all the best and if anyone does look at your stuff please go check you guys out cuz uh I think you do some great yeah. stuff so uh oh, thanks a lot. Yeah. It was great to be here. It's yeah. brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much for inviting us. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for having us on. No worries. All right. Cheers and uh, we'll catch you in a bit.